Hello and welcome to The Excerpts. I'm Taylor Wilson. Losing a pet can be devastating. Animals become part of our lives and part of our families, and that treasure time together often feels far too short. How do we make sense of those feelings and cope when we lose our furry loved ones? Tom Nichols, a staff writer at The Atlantic, examines some of his own emotions in the wake of his cat Carla's passing and joins me now to discuss. Tom, thanks for being on The Excerpt today. Thanks for having me. So, Tom, we should just tell our listeners and viewers that pets is not your regular beat. You normally write about politics. So just start out, if you would, Tom, by telling us about your experience with pets. Did you grow up with them? And who was your first pet? I did. Um, I grew up with uh, cats. I I wanted a dog when I was a little boy, but um, my family thought that was high maintenance. And it turns out I wasn't a very attentive little boy. So dogs were you know, sort of more than I was able to take care of. And then when I was in first grade, um, we got a little gray kitten. And because I grew up with the Dick and Jane spot and puff readers that all children in the, you know, early 1960s read, I imagine imaginatively named my cat Puff after the cat in the book. So my very first cat was a wonderful gray cat named Puff. And um, we had him right until I was in... Uh, almost through high school. Wow. And so I mentioned Carla in the intro. Who was Carla? Tell us about her and how you found her. Oh, Carla was actually in the window of the veterinarian that was right downstairs from me when I was living in downtown Newport, Rhode Island. I was 50-ish, my late 40s, early 50s. I was recently divorced. I was just a mess. You know, I was depressed. I was drinking too much. And I would take walks um, because downtown Newport's a nice place to take a walk. And and I would go past this window where the veterinarian had adoptable animals. And there was this beautiful, regal-looking black cat with big gold green eyes. And I would just stare at her and she would kind of stare back at me. And then I would say, no, I'm I'm too much of a mess right now to take care of, you know, anything. I can barely take care of myself. So I would walk on and then the next day I would take a walk and I would stare at the cat and the cat would kind of stare back at me like, okay, it's you again. Hello. And um, finally, I, uh, I was walking with my good friend who was also my next door neighbor. And he said, look, you obviously love this cat. You stare at her every day. Why don't you just go in and get her? And so I went in and it turned out she had somehow ended up astray, but, but had clearly grown up with a family. She'd been spayed. She was in good health and had a wonderful temperament. And, um, that's how I met her. And I named her Carla because I loved the TV show Cheers, which I had watched in my twenties and she was black and furry. And she were, so I said, I named her after the frizzy haired, black haired waitress in Cheers. And she became Carla Tortelli Nichols. So you said Carla had this um, strange, kind of hard to describe presence about her. Uh, What did you mean by that? You know, some animals, especially dogs and cats, but I I think other people have seen it in other animals. I I know some people have had rabbits will say the same thing. Some animals just have um, an emotional intelligence about them, not in the sense that you can train them to do tricks or fetch or whatever, but they just seem to connect to people. And, you know, I've had I've had probably in my life three or four cats. Um, Some of them do, some of them don't. But Carla really had this way of just kind of this presence, you know, where, like I said, when I would walk by the vet and she would just kind of look back at me, you know, instead of slumbering or looking at me, I would stare at her and she'd look at me as if to say, okay, you know, what, what? And that really turned out to be true. She was, she was very personable, could really sense when you were upset were happy, loved children. If she heard children anywhere in the house, she would come running down and just be around them in this very present way. She wouldn't necessarily play with them. She would kind of be like a, like dogs are with children. She would sort of shepherd them and kind of go in circles around them. She just was very much a cat that if, if she came into the room, you know, you kind of knew she was there. And, and some dogs and cats are a little more laid back. They don't do that. Um, they may attach to an owner, but the, Carla was, especially if we had a social event, Carla was practically like a hostess. I mean, she would just come downstairs, sit right in the middle of a group of people and kind of look around, you know, again, as if to say, so, uh, what are we talking about? Yeah. And, um, that, that was really an amazing thing about her because it made her very easy to connect with and, and to be attached to because she reciprocated that. That's beautiful, Tom. So you wrote about this moment where Carla accepted Lynn, your partner, 
What was it like bringing these two important parts of your life together? I know this can be kind of a tricky balancing act. I've done this before with past partners and and animals. How, how did this go? Well, I can compare it. Um, I've been married twice. So the first time I was married, I, I came into the marriage with a cat named Daisy, who was a very loving, um, adorable cat. Um, but Daisy very much felt like I was her person. And when I got married, she never got used to it. She didn't really spend a lot of time around my wife. Um, if my wife got out of bed in the morning, Daisy would jump up to where my wife was and then curl up next to me. Um, she was almost, you know, jealous. Yeah. Carla was different. Carla sort of regarded when I started dating Lynn, I was, when I was in, you know, after my first marriage, she sort of would, you know, come out and let Lynn pet her and sort of hang around and, but didn't really show a lot of affection to her. And then I think over time she said, she said, okay, she's okay. And one morning I, I, and I put a picture of it in the um, piece that I wrote for the Atlantic. I woke up and there was Carla curled up around Lynn's head on the bed purring. And I, I think that was Carla saying, all right, I have vetted this person. I will let her stay. She's cool. And when Lynn and I got married, um, and we're, we're still married, Carla became Lynn's buddy. I mean, they would spend their day. I'm a night owl. Lynn would get up in the morning. Carla would spend the day with her, then come up, hang with me, come back downstairs. So Carla went from kind of checking Lynn out to saying, this is, this is my gal pal. You know, we spend the days together. So there was a really powerful part of this piece that struck me as a surprise. I did not expect this turn, Tom, when Carla saved your and Lynn's lives. What happened here? It was the day after Christmas, uh, more than six years ago. And again, I'm a night owl. I stay up. I, I have a fire in the fireplace. Carla kind of hangs with me. I went to bed, got up. I was sleeping in and Carla came upstairs very early and woke up both me and Lynn. And, you know, kind of walking on our heads and meowing. And that was unusual for her. And Lynn thought, okay, she just wants breakfast. Cats do that. Feed me, feed me. Lynn went downstairs and Carla actually stayed with me. She was just kind of prowling around. And Lynn came back upstairs and said, I smell smoke. And I went downstairs and it turns out that the fireplace had been poorly constructed and there was now fire burning underneath the floor and smoke coming into my basement. And I, when I came down there, I realized we were like in real trouble. We called 911. And then all the smoke alarms went off. So Carla bought us about 15 or 20 minutes ahead of time because she smelled the smoke. And the fire marshal told me later that if the cat hadn't woke us up and gotten us moving, that that fire would have broken through the floor. Very dangerous kind of fire where they get trapped between the floor and the ceiling of the downstairs. Also unusual was that Carla just waited. I, Lynn went back upstairs, grabbed Carla, and I said, go sit in the car. It was winter. It was during a terrible cold snap in December. And uh, they went and sat in the car together. But the other thing the fire marshal told me is that cats are very often the most likely casualty, pet casualty of a fire because their instinct is to go and hide, especially when the alarms go off and there's all kinds of chaos. And Carla didn't. She came upstairs. She woke us up. She waited. She said, go, you know, again, with that presence that this that this cat seemed to have. And then we spent a month in a hotel while, while our house was being rebuilt. And, and as I say in the piece, I think Carla thinks that was very much the best time of her life. <laughs> Two rooms, big picture window, litter box food, her people, and a big bed all, all within sight of each other. And I think Carla said that that was just the best place I've ever lived. Yeah, what more could you ask for as a cat? So unfortunately, these, these animals don't live forever, Tom. They have much shorter lives than any of us would prefer. Tell us about the end of Carla's life and some of her health issues and how you navigated that. She started to have just general problems and she started to look mangy, you know, which for her was very unusual because she had just a beautiful cat, always took, took good care of herself. And what we found was she was starting to have thyroid trouble. Um, so we had to start giving her thyroid medication that helped for a while, but she started losing weight over the course of a year, year and a half. You know, she was just getting old, but toward the end, I think she knew. The night before I took her, she was sitting downstairs with me. Lynn was asleep and she got on my chest and she sort of head bumped me and purred. And then she just kind of walked over and sat down on the couch and sort of tucked up. And I think that was her way of saying, okay, you know, um, I get it. So 
I took her, I held her um, while they um, gave her the first shot. And that made her drowsy and put her to sleep. And then we, Lynn and I both kind of put our arms around her while they gave her the second shot. And then, uh, then she was gone. I'm so sorry, Tom. It's absolutely brutal. So, uh, you know, you rescued Carla, as you mentioned here at the beginning of the conversation, but you wrote in this piece that the cat really saved you. Powerful words there, Tom. Uh, how so? Why is that? You know, I was really kind of hitting bottom in my life in so many ways. I mean, financially, emotionally, I, it was classic divorced guy moment, right? I'm living next to a bar. I was just kind of hanging on by my fingernails emotionally. And this cat comes into my life and it's like, look, I get it. You're bummed, but you know, I, I still need food. Um, and I wouldn't mind if you'd kind of pet me for a while. And so we got into this routine where I would just come home and I'd make a bowl of popcorn and she'd sit on the arm of my chair and we would watch TV. Our th- As I said in the piece, I think Carla and I have seen every episode of Law & Order SVU ever made. Because, you know, it was in those days, it was on heavy rotation and, and repeats. And I'd just sit there and, you know, we'd sort of chat and I'd say, well, I, I think the teacher did it, you know, or I don't think it was the coach. It was just such a healing thing because she would just sit there. I mean, she didn't just come out, get fed and then go away and go to sleep somewhere. If I was home, she, she was with me. It reminded me that, you know, there are things that make you happy um, when you're very depressed. And, and at that point in my life, I decided to get some help from a you know, good doctor, a good counselor a good priest. And um, Carla was a big part of that. She really was. Tom, you wrote this piece earlier this summer in May. What have the months been like since? How have you and Lynn been adjusting to life without Carla? For the first month or so, and, and I, I I think this is common to everyone who's lost a pet, I kept looking at, at thinking I saw her. The old habits, I'd wake up and I'd sort of look over into my daughter's room where she would usually sleep. And it took a while to get used to, you know, dinner time. Carla had a very keen sense of time. This cat, it's almost like the cat had a watch. Five o'clock, she'd come downstairs. She'd sit in the living room, look at us and say, you know, what are we having tonight? And it took a while to get, to get over that routine. I couldn't think about getting another cat, but I think, I think Lynn and I, um, we're, we're getting close. I think this fall we're ready to, you know, bring, bring some uh, cats back into our home because I know this sounds terrible, but I also know that my father said it when he lost a cat. I've heard other people say it. There are people I've lost that I didn't miss as much because I didn't spend every day with them. It's a weird thing to say, well, I miss my cat more than I miss my, you know, my uncle Mike, but I didn't see uncle Mike every day. And, um, you know, this, this really was losing an immediate member of the family. So it took a while to get past that. It was very hard. These are close, intimate relationships. So do you have any advice that you would give out to folks who are going through their own loss of a pet? Yeah. The first thing I would say is don't be ashamed to feel so intensely about an animal. I mean, anyone anyone who walks up to you and says, well, it's just a dog or it's just a cat or whatever. These are people that are, you know, just don't get it. Lynn and I, you know, we're both in our 60s. We walked out of the vet's office and, you know, tears streaming down our face. And, you know, when her ashes arrived and we put them out in the garden, we cried again. I mean, it's okay to feel that way about your your little companion. Um, it's normal and it's good. And I guess the second thing to say is it's okay to start thinking about getting another animal at some point. That's how I got Carla after I lost Daisy, who I loved and had been with me since I was in my 30s. You know, when I lost Daisy, I was heartbroken. But if I hadn't decided to gather another cat, I wouldn't have met Carla. So there's always another friend out there waiting to be found. Beautifully put. Tom, thank you so much for being on the excerpt and sharing your experiences here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching. I'm Taylor Wilson. I'll see you next time.